I believe it's going to be life-changing. Amen? How many of you guys need a life-changing word? All right, I don't know about you, but I need a life-changing word. Turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Timothy chapter 1. We've been talking about dynamic living, moving forward from glory to glory, amen? It is not God's will for you to be stagnant in your relationship with Him. Matter of fact, He says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. So there is a progression, there is a moving forward in God. There's not a stepping back, there's not being stagnant and just staying it's advancing in Him. Amen? And God's called us to move from glory to glory. Everybody say glory to glory. That's God's will for your life. We want to advance in the Word. Amen? We want to advance in our personal relationship with the Lord. We want to advance in prayer and in worship and in serving. And, and that's what this class is all about. And so there's some things we're going to deal with tonight in the Word that's going to help us. But I want us to start here at 1 Timothy chapter 1, starting with verse 18. Are you there? Everybody's there. <clears throat> Verse 18. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, having faith and a good conscience, which some, having rejected concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck, of whom... Himaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Father, I pray that you anoint this word, anoint our ears to hear, our hearts to receive, that we may be changed tonight by the reading of your word. For Lord, your word is life to us, and it produces life in us. So we thank you, Father, for it in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, amen, amen. Thank you, Darcel. You may be seated. Man. I love Wednesday nights. Wednesday nights is it's real nice because it's a little bit more intimate, and I take my time, and we just have a good time uh, in the Word. But I want to talk about a few things, and it is a little bit more of a style of teaching versus just preaching. We're really going to get into the Word tonight and, and discover some of the things that God wants to do in us. Amen? But I want to take a look at just this stanza. Paul is dealing with a very interesting issue, and sadly, it's a controversial issue within the church. And there's a word that we're going to kind of hang out with and, and, and talk about and really dig into, and that's that word shipwrecked. Now, that's a very interesting word. And Paul would say that their faith, <clears throat> let's read that just that part right there. He says, having faith and a good conscience which some, having rejected concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck. What does that mean to be shipwrecked? Stranded? You know, I remember when I was, was a, a, just a young guy, and uh, I was probably, probably about 11, maybe, maybe 10 years old, and we went into this small boat. It's like one of those mini, mini yachts, but it was a sailboat. It had a little room down, down in the, what is that called, the... When you go down into, is it, what is it called? Down into the boat. Is it a cabin? What do they call that? Though? Some, some sci galley, some scientific scientific name. Scientific. Anyways, I'm just playing. My goodness. There we go. We had a laugh. Was that a laugh? Somebody laughed. You guys are looking at me going, it's okay. We can have fun. Just relax. It's going to be all okay. All right, you guys are just getting ready for your, your clinching, man. Just getting ready for the whoosh. It ain't coming. We're just going to have a good time tonight, all right? We're going to get in the Word. So relax. It's going to be okay. I want you to listen. Here, here, here I was, and we we're heading to Molokai. Now, how many of you guys have ever crossed the Molokai Channel? Anybody? It is the roughest waters on the planet. It is scary, and I don't recommend it. Um, they have a big, massive Molokai boat that goes from Maui to Molokai. And it's huge, and that thing gets rocking. And I've, every time I go on, I just get so sick. I say, I'm never doing this again. But here we were in this small, tiny sailboat, and <clears throat> we're crossing the Molokai Channel. And this boat is going like this, and I'm scared, and our whole family's in there. And all of a sudden, the guy that owns the boat hands 
me the wheel. And I'm sitting there going like this. And he says, just aim for that. Aim for that right there. And I'm looking at the target, which was this cliff off, off of Molokai, all right? And he says, just take the boat there. So I, I, I'm, I'm serious. I'm standing there like this. I'm not moving. <laughs> I'm so scared. And this thing is moving. It's rocking back and forth. I'm like, it's not, we're going to die. And the whole time he's laughing because really I'm not even controlling the boat. He had some mechanism to control. But it was funny <clears throat> while it was happening. But you know what, what took place, interestingly enough, was this. He had this sensor on the bottom of his boat that told him how deep the waters were. And there were moments when we started getting close to Molokai where the waters got very, very shallow. You see, when you're, when you're in a ship, there's so many variables that happen. There's the winds. There's the waves. If a storm comes, there's shallow water. There's deep water. There's all these different things that we have to be aware of. And I want to tell you something. The enemy's goal, his objective, his objective is to shipwreck you. He wants to throw every wave he can at you. He wants to get you off course. He wants you to drown and sink. He wants you to get caught up on a reef. Whatever he can do to stop you, he's going to do. Are you understanding what I'm saying? And we, that's, we, we live in this world. And interestingly enough, Paul calls it the good warfare. This battle that we fight. We're not here to just hang out. And it's frustrating at times because as Christians, we just want to hang out, don't we? It's like, let's just hang out. Let's have fun. Let's not worry about anything. But we're in a fight. And we're not just in a fight for our life. We're in a fight for other lives. We're soul winners, amen? If you're going to be a part of this house, you're going to be a soul winner. You're not just here to hang out. You're not a pew warmer, amen? The enemy attempts to shipwreck you. But the truth is, there's only one person that can shipwreck you, and that's you. See, if I would have gotten off of course as that young boy holding that wheel, and I would have gotten off course, I would have very easily been shipwrecked. If I wouldn't have watched my gauges and looked at the depth of the bottom floor, I, I could have been shipwrecked and run right into a reef. I have to remain focused. And in this life that we live, we have to remain focused on Christ. And really, there's an intensity, especially within 1 Timothy chapter 1, there's an intensity that Paul is relating to Timothy saying, look, man, you've got to have divine focus. You've got to have a focus. Stop getting your eyes off of all these other things. Stop, stop, trying to be, stop being persuaded by all these different other philosophies and theologies. You keep focused on the direction that I have called you to. Now, you have to have a focus in your life in Christ. Interestingly enough, here's Peter, and we all know the story of Peter. He gets off out of the boat and starts walking on water, right? The Bible says that the, the winds, he saw the effects of the waves and the wind, right? Now, how do you see the wind? You can't see the wind. You see the effects of the wind. And in seeing the effects of the wind, he took his eyes off of Jesus. And where do you think he saw the effects of the wind? On his boat? Come on. I've actually been in one of those boats that they had, those fishing boats. And you know what? Those things are quite interesting. They're very interesting boats. And <clears throat> we were in the middle I don't even remember where it was, but we're in the middle of the water, and the wind starts picking up, and this boat starts rocking. Now, all of Peter's life is in this boat. And as that wind starts picking up and the wave starts crashing, let me tell you what happens. Everything in your mind starts going, well, what about this? And we start going, and we start contemplating all these different scenarios. Have you guys ever been in that place in your life? where the wave starts crashing, the wind starts blowing, and your mind just starts going like this. And, and you start thinking of every bad scenario that's going to happen. This is going to take place. I'm going to lose this, and my, my, my business is going to crash, and we're going to have problems, and we're... Disaster. See, one of the things that gets us off focus is really the battle that we have in our mind. 
And we have to deal with the battle in our mind. What does Romans chapter 12 say? Romans chapter 12 says what? Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There has to be a renewing in your mind to start thinking differently. Because really the biggest battle is not the wind and the waves. The biggest battle is the wind and the waves and how it affects your mind. And how you see and how you perceive the storms and the challenges of life. Whether it be the challenges in your marriage, the challenges in your business, the challenges even in your body. It's really how you see it. Because if you see that storm as greater than Christ, you have a problem. Because now you've taken your eyes off of Christ, just like Peter did, right? And he put it onto the waves, into the wind. So we have to have this determination and this focus to say, Christ, I'm going to keep my eyes on you. That is one of the first and foremost things that we have to deal with if we're going to deal with being shipwrecked and how to stay away from being shipwrecked. See, as your pastor, I don't want anybody in this house to get shipwrecked. Amen? I want you guys to reach the place and the promise that God has for you. I want you to get there. I want you to go to the other side. Amen? I want you to step into your promise. I don't want you to sink. Amen? Everybody say, we need divine focus. Now, I want to just give you this because this helps us a lot. The Holy Spirit helps you with divine focus. I'll tell you how. Because the Holy Spirit, man, I, I, may, not need to, I may not be able to go down this route because it just gets a little too deep. Let me just give this to you without, without having to go to the next page of notes. Are you ready? The Holy Spirit sees differently than we see. Okay? And many of you have heard this before. We, we function in one dimension. All right? I can see those doors, but if someone was standing behind those doors, I wouldn't be able to see past those doors. Right? The Holy Spirit does. And the way He functions even in time and understanding time is He sees very differently than we do. He sees beyond the different dimension that we're stuck in. You guys understand that? And so the Holy Spirit has the ability to speak to us and give us direction and help us function in this divine focus because if we learn how to depend upon the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit is saying to us and depend upon His Word and what He's speaking to us instead of what the storm is saying, at times what the storm is screaming at us, right? And we learn how to depend upon the voice of the Holy Spirit and being led by Him. Just as Paul says, to keep in step with the Holy Spirit. Because He'll lead you. He'll guide you. As a matter of fact, Jesus says that that is one of His responsibilities. It's to be a guide to you, an advocate even. And so we have to realize this, that in our life with the Holy Spirit, we have to depend upon Him to keep that focus. And by allowing Him in our life to give us direction, to give, we, we have to give our, our ears to Him for Him to speak to us. We have to trust in Him. Right? And that comes with relationship. You can't be led by the Holy Spirit without relationship. It just will not happen. It cannot happen. And many of us will say, well, I need to go get in His presence. Now look, I'm all about getting in the presence of the Lord. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. In His presence is fullness of joy. I love what the Lord does to us, especially in His presence. We never want to take for granted His presence. Amen? But just simply being in His presence and having a relationship is very different. And many people substitute just being in the presence of God and don't push beyond the obstacle of actually building a relationship with Him by denying even fleshly tendencies to say, this is what I want to do, this is where I want to go, and really learn how to talk with the Holy Spirit and let the Holy Spirit talk to you. We have to learn how to step outside of our comfort zone and dig deep. Now, there, there just, it was a couple weeks ago, I had a young lady, uh, on Sunday nights we have Holy Ghost night, and Sunday nights we just, we just go for it. There's times, I remember uh, maybe it was a month ago, uh, I, I got up to preach on a Sunday night. Our Sunday night service starts at 6. And I got up to preach on Sunday night at 7.16. Is what time, that's what time we got done worshiping. We worship for a whole hour and 16 minutes. You say, well, what is that about? Well, that's not a normal Sunday morning. 
Of course, if that was a normal Sunday morning, who knows? We might have 20,000 people in here, or we'd probably have 20. But we want to create an atmosphere where we learn how to push. We learn how to press in to the Lord. Just like David did. David was so obsessed with the presence of God, he learned how to press in to his presence. Now, I know I'm just talking to you right now. I'm, I'm just, I feel like the Holy Spirit's just been encouraging me. This isn't even in my notes, okay? I want to encourage you in this. We have to realize that if we want more and we want a greater relationship with the Holy Spirit, we have to get beyond that comfort zone and learn how to press in in prayer, press in in worship, get beyond all the distractions and say, Lord, right now I'm here to encounter you. We have to become like Jacob. I ain't leaving here until you bless me. I ain't going nowhere. And you know, sometimes it takes time. Not because the Holy Spirit's limited to time or it takes Him three hours to move. Many times it takes us that time to get ourselves out of the way and let the Holy Spirit move. You guys with me? That's why we have Sunday nights. So it's that Holy Ghost night where you can press in. You don't have to worry about it. You just press in. But see, this shouldn't be a Sunday night occurrence. That should be an everyday occurrence in your life. Pressing into the Lord. And that's what the Lord desires of you. We have to have that, that relationship with Him. But this is one of the problems we deal with. Is this hyper-spirituality. Anybody with me? We think that we have to be hyper-spiritual in order to press into the Holy Spirit. Like you have to have all the right words to say, all the right these and thousis and thusis, right? Only, you can only read King James in order to press into the Holy Spirit. No, but interestingly enough, there's people that have a lot of barriers. Because not only do we battle with the barriers of the flesh and our, our natural tendencies to feel very uncomfortable, and I'll be very honest with you, it is extremely uncomfortable to press into the Holy Spirit, to press into God. Because it starts with the, den the denying of your flesh and the desires of your flesh. I'm not talking about going to another dimension. I'm talking about denying your flesh. The, th this, is the, this is the typical one, right? Sunday mornings. Oh, man, come on, dude. Oh, man, the buffet is going to close. Oh, come on, can't he? You know, why can't I should have just gone to the hour service today. No, I'm, I'm serious. That's a natural tendency, right? We get very impatient. That is a natural tendency of ours is to get very impatient because we say, man, I, I got this other, I got to feed my flesh or I've got to, there's my show's coming on. I, I hope he, Hawaii Five O is almost done. Shoot, I'm going to miss it. Nobody else watches Hawaii Five O, really? Come on, man. That's like, you can't, you're not even allowed to live in Hawaii if you don't watch Hawaii Five O, man. That's, come on, support. Anyways, represent. <laughs> Are you guys with me? All these obstacles that we, we face. You have to be willing to say, you know what, Lord? All those things are not important to me. What's most important to me is your presence. What's most important to me is to know you. To hear your voice. Jesus says it clearly. He says, my sheep know my voice. There's a knowing. I'll say it again on this side. There's a knowing that you can have of the Lord. Not as just some being up in heaven that's far away from us. But he says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He says, I stick closer to you than even a brother. I'm close to you. He wants to know you and he wants you to know him. That relationship that Moses had, and however we want to define it, very simply, the Bible says that in the tent of meeting, Moses would meet with the Lord face to face. Many of us theologians think of that in a different way because we understand especially that there's a moment where God says, sorry, you can't look upon my face. It'll kill you. <laughs> so the Lord showed him his backside. So what does it mean face to face? It means in a relationship in an intimate relationship with Him. But the problem is with most of us, we have the tendency to seek His hand and not His face. Lord, what can You do for me? Instead of, Lord, who are You? Are You with me? So these are some of the obstacles that we face. And, and until 
because we, we, we're talking about divine focus. If you want to find divine focus, it is found in your pursuit after him. And everything else follows in line. Amen? It's, it's not in our pursuit after position. And I, I talked about that a few Sundays ago. So we have to be very careful. What if God stripped everything away from you? Who would you be? See, it's our pursuit after him because our entire identity is wrapped up in who he is. Who we are. We can't even truly understand who we are until we understand him. And then in that moment, we begin to understand who we are in him. Are you guys with me? We have to have focus. Everybody say, be focused. Now, let's, let's move on to the text here. Are you guys with me? <clears throat> Paul begins to speak to Timothy, verse 18, and deals with an issue. He says, this charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them, everybody say, that by them, you may wage the good warfare. Now, this is interesting. A prophetic word comes to Timothy, and Timothy receives some prophetic words. And many of you, if you've been to the prophetic conference, you've received a prophetic word from the Lord. Or even beyond that, you, you've received a word from the Lord. The Holy Spirit has spoken to you. You've received something, a promise. How many of you guys have ever been in the Word, and you're reading the Word, and the Lord says, that's for you? You guys ever done that before? The Lord spoke to you and said, that's you. Hold on to that. God's given me words like that too before. I'm, I'm, I'm reading this thing, and even though this thing happened thousands of years ago, and it was written a long time ago, the Lord says, that's your word. Why? Because the word is still alive. Amen? So what happens is this. Timothy receives this word, and many of times we don't understand the power of the word that's given. Now we know that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word, right? Right? But we have to realize that even in contending for what God has for us, we have to have the ability to use the Word of the Lord and the promises of God and that which has been spoken over us as a weapon to wage against the enemy. And that's what Paul was telling Timothy. He says, listen... You've had words that have been spoken over your life. You've been called by God. You've answered the call. And all these other things are coming your way. All these other obstacles are, are facing you. And what they're trying to do is come against the very word that has been spoken over you. The very promises that you've received. You've got to learn how to take those promises and apply them and say, excuse me, devil, that's contrary to the promise that God gave me. So you need to... Right? We have to learn how to do that. You have to learn how to use the Word of God. You have to learn how to use the Word of God. You have to learn how to use the prophetic Word that comes forth from the Holy Spirit into your life and say, you know what? God has a call on my life. When the devil tries to tell you, you know what? You're sick. You're always going to be sick. You're never going to get healed. It's very easy for us to say, oh man, devil, you're so right. I'm sick. I'm always going to be sick. I'll never be healed. There's a problem with that. That's contrary to the Word. I've got this problem. I'm always going to have this problem. I've got this bondage. I'm always going to have this bondage. I've got this fear. I'm always going to have this fear. You're a loser. You're always going to be a loser. Whoa, 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 whoa. If you don't know the word, then you'll never know that what the lies of the enemy, the lies the enemy is trying to feed you are contrary to the promise and the word that God's given you. You have to know the word because the word becomes a weapon for you to fight the enemy. See, he's the, he's the author of lies. He's going to lie to you. He's going to try and get you off of focus, get you off of the direction, right, that God has for you. But you see, when we use, number one, the Holy Spirit, when we have the Holy Spirit as our guide and our compass, but we also have the Word as our guide and our compass, let me tell you something. The power of the written Word. As you stand upon this Word, and you understand that these are more 
This is more than just black letters on white pages. That this is the promise of God. That this is truth. When you understand the word as such, then it doesn't matter what lie the devil tries to feed you. You can stand upon the word and you can say, I'm sorry, I will not be moved. You cannot convince me of anything contrary to what is in this word. Because not only is your identity caught, tied up with your relationship with the Lord, but it's also tied up with your relationship with the Word. Paul tells Timothy, Timothy, you got to learn how to fight with the Word. Fight with those prophetic words that have been given you. I have, to, I have to do this all the time. There are moments, even as a pastor, you look out and you're like, oh, Jesus, what's happening? And there are times where I have to remind myself, Lord, you said we're going to have an awesome children's revival in this church. You said, Lord, that this house is going to be a house of healing and a house of hope. You said, Lord, that we're going to reach thousands of people. And I have to hold on to those promises that the Lord spoke to me. But you see, how can I know those promises? Because the promises received, now the promises we receive are not just promises that we receive through this word. Because God still speaks. Look at the person next to you and say, God still speaks. He still speaks to you just like he spoke to Moses. Come on. Now, he may not use a burning bush. If he does, take a picture and <laughs> Facebook it, man. I want to see it. <laughs> but, but I need you to hear this. I need you to hear this. See, in this, now we're taking it a whole other level. Are you, right? you guys still following me? We have the Word. We have the Holy Spirit that speaks to us. But now when you tie the Holy Spirit and the Word together, you understand that they don't conflict or they don't contradict each other. So we test the spirits, and we've said this before, but this is a, this is a different class than what we do on a Sunday. We can get a little deeper. We test the Spirit through the Word. If the Spirit is contrary to what the Word says, we know that it's not the Spirit of God. you understanding that. However, we understand also that the Word does not exist just by itself, that the Word is still moving because God still speaks, so the Holy Spirit can speak to you. And that even now, the Holy Spirit can speak, or the Lord can speak to you in such a way where he can confirm to you and he can give you promises to say things like, Mariah, you're going to do this and this and this. And when you know, now hear me, when you know that it's the Lord and it's a promise from God, you know how to fight for it. But when you don't know that it was God and you're not sure, and that, it, it, look, it's the same lie from the beginning. What does Satan do? Eve. Did he really say? Hello, same fight from the very beginning. Are you sure? He's still playing that game. He ain't got no new tricks up his sleeve. I'm telling you, the dude is still playing the same game from the very beginning. But when your relationship is strong and you know who has spoken to you, then in that, you know how to contend for that word and fight for it. You have to be willing to do that. You have to be confident in the word of the Lord. Do you know why this church preaches the word? So you can be confident. That's why I preach from this thing. This, I think it's, it's Bible. Now, I'm at Kahala Mall, right, for my for my men's group, and I, I got my Bible in my hand, and uh, I'm just walking down Kahala Mall, you know, it's got Holy Bible, I'm walking down Kahala Mall, and just hanging out, walking through Whole Foods, trying to get some kale, <clears throat> they say it's healthy, I don't believe it, I'm telling you, cheeseburgers are healthy, That's, it satisfies the bones, come on, can I get an amen, <laughs> I, got a, I got a witness, You know, people are looking at me crazy. This thing is precious to me. It's so valuable to me. 
This is the thing I stand upon. This is the foundation of my life. Come on. All right, I need to move on because the next part is fun. Everybody say the word. Everybody say contend, fight, war for the promise and with the promise. All right. Verse 19. Having faith and a good conscience, which some, having rejected concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck. Now, we're going to take an example. We're going to take a look at an example. There's Himaeus and there's Alexander. Now, now the Lord, uh, Paul uses these two examples to pinpoint what he just said in verse 19 of one of the struggles that are taking place. And he talks about them in, in, in some different areas. Uh, he talks about them in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 17. Look at, look at that real quick because we can begin to understand what the issue was that Himaeus had. And uh, as we look at in, in 2 Timothy chapter 17, and their message will spread like cancer, Emmaus, uh, uh, sorts who, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, and they overthrew the faith of some. Now, we don't have enough time. Whew. Maybe we do. No, we don't. Basically, there were two things that happened to Emmaus and Alexander. Number one, there's a compromise in their morals. They begin to stray. You see it very clearly. <clears throat> they did not turn from evil. Now, one of the problems that we have, and I said this two weeks ago on a Sunday morning, one of the problems that we, we, we have in our life is this is the deceitfulness of sin. The problem is not that God doesn't forgive. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Amen? The issue is not that God doesn't forgive. The issue is the deceitfulness of sin. That sin has a tendency to harden your heart. So here you have Hermaeus and Alexander who are actually believers in Jesus but what happened in their life is there was a deceitfulness that came into their life. They began to loosen up their morals a little bit. That's why Paul says it to, to Timothy. He says, look, you need to hold on to faith and a good conscience. You have to make sure that you're of strong moral, that you have strong moral integrity, and you have to fight for that. Because many of us, we want to be loose, right? We want to just do whatever we want, say whatever we want, watch whatever we want, right? And we think it's okay. The problem is, it's not okay. Because it has the ability to defile. It's just like what Madonna said about MTV. When MTV first came out, Madonna has this, this thought that she shares. She says, you know, the first time people watch MTV, they're going to be grossed out. They're going to watch it and they're going to see it. And they're going to say, oh, man, that's horrible. They may, even, they may even gag. Second time, they're going to feel, oh, I'm, maybe I shouldn't be watching this. The third time, they'll watch it. The fourth time, they'll watch it. The fifth time, they'll be addicted to it. It's how it works. That's how defilement works. It's a, it's, a, it's a loosing of morals and saying, well, that's not that important or that's not that big of a deal. And, and pretty soon, we become defiled by these things and and really what, what used to be horrific in our eyes is so acceptable. Now we look and we say, wow, that would never happen to me. I'm such a good man. But it's very easy. Because if, if we're not careful, now you have to realize too who Paul is talking to. Paul is speaking to Timothy, but he's also speaking to the church, and he's speaking to leaders. That's why he begins to talk to Timothy about saying, look, we have to realize that there, there, there's a standard that leaders must keep. Why? It's not because we want to be legalistic or religious. That's not it. It's that what we want to do is we want to make sure that we do not give Satan even a hint 
no room. We want to leave no room for him because we don't want to leave room for deceit and we don't want to be led astray. Are you with me? And that's what, that's what Paul is saying. Is it, it, the, the way to keep focused many times is to get rid of the distractions. Right? Just not, look, today, I was, this morning, I, I come into prayer, and I'm, I'm on my desk, and I'm, I got music on and worship music. I love worship music, but I, I, I'm a little ADHD, DDH, DDH, and, uh, and I, I'm sitting at my, my desk, and I'm trying to get into the Word. You know, I've been, I've been doing a study uh, through the Beatitudes and just having a lot of fun, you know, Matthew chapter 5, and really just going at it. And I got the music going, and my, my brain's kind of like, music, word, music, word. And finally, I just got to turn, I got to turn off one of them. Now, some of you, you can, you can multitask and you can do all that stuff. But I, for me, it's either I'm either reading or I'm listening and worshiping. I cannot do both at the same time. It just doesn't work. My wife, I'm watching TV. My wife tries to talk to me, and I'm just like, take out the trash. I, what, what, I, I don't know what you're talking about. It's not that I do it on purpose. It's, I'm engaged. I had to, you know, this morning, I had to turn off the music so I could focus. In the same way, that's what happens. If we're not careful, the enemy will try and put these things in our life, trying to attach us. That's why in the book of Hebrews says, take off the weights that so easily ensnare us. Because it's easy to get tripped up by all these distractions. Look, if I'm going to be for God, I'm going to be all out for God. I don't need all that other stuff. All that other stuff has no benefit to me. The only thing that benefits me, and you have to make a decision, what benefits you the most? Is it having a life where you got a portion of the Lord and a portion of the world, or you're saying, look, I'm all out for God. I don't need that junk. That, that's not a part of my life anymore. And that really is what... Paul is talking to Timothy about it. He says, you have to be careful. Don't be like Himaeus. Don't, don't have these loose morals where it's very easy for the enemy to come in and deceive you. And pretty soon, all you know is you've got... And this is the worst part. We have, these, we have this looseness in our morals or this immorality in our life. And then we begin to create a doctrine to make excuse for our immorality. For our inability or worse, not just the inability, but the desire to say, I want to do what I want to do. Last time I checked, the Bible says we don't have that option. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives inside me. This is not a game we play. This isn't a religion. This is a relationship. When I married my wife, I said, I made a declaration that I was not going to have a relationship with anyone else. And we're talking about dynamic living, amen? Some of you guys are looking at me going, dude, this is heavy. You want me to preach this on a Sunday morning? <laughs> I know this is heavy. I know this is heavy, but this is the Word. Hello, this is the Word. And look, Paul's not, talk, look, Paul's not talking to just anybody. He's talking to Timothy. He's talking to a leader. I'm not looking out here just talking to anybody. I'm not talking, about, I'm not talking to a first-time visitor, well, one, but a first-time. But he's a man of God. He's a man of God, so I can preach like this. So it doesn't matter, all right? Then leave me alone. But I'm not, I'm not just preaching to anybody. Many of you are already integrated. You're, you're here. You're saying, I want to advance in my relationship with the Lord. Well, if you want to advance, you've got to make a decision. Will you move up to the standard? Will you raise your standards and say, Lord, I, I don't want to just have any kind of standard in my life or live any way I want. I want to live the way you want me to live. I want to live a life led by the Spirit, a life dictated by the Word of God. Amen? We're not talking about legalism. Stop. And isn't that the worst thing? Well, you're just legalistic. No, 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 no. No, I see the Word that the Lord has given me. When he says, be ye holy, for I am holy. Oh, really? And Paul gives him a challenge. And Paul even, Paul even makes that standard. Saying, if you're going to be a bishop, if you're going to be a deacon in the church, this is how I want you to live. Why? 
because we cannot give the enemy room in our life. Amen? But the other thing is this. There was a, not only was there an issue with immorality in, in, in their life, <clears throat> but what began to happen is there was a distorting of theology. The sad thing is this, even though the Word of God is so straightforward, the Word of God is so straightforward, we mess it up all the time. Because sadly, we want it to say what we want it to say. And what you see, what happened with Himaeus is that he abandoned his faith and what he believed in Christ what he truly believed. And he began to fall into the lies. He began to adopt these other philosophies and theologies that came his way. He said, man, I like the way that sounds. Ooh, I like the way that sounds. Ooh, that's good. And we have a warning. We have a warning. Do not just have our ears, because there's going to be false prophets that are going to come just to tickle our ears. Tell us things that make us feel good about ourselves. You know, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I know that we, we have to find a balance. You know, there's, there's <clears throat> you have to be careful. If you go to a church, and I'm just being honest with you, if you go to a church where you always leave that church going, oh, I feel so good, I'm out, I, everything's okay, you might be in trouble. Right? It's actually okay every so often to leave going like this, oh. Every so often. Now, I'm trying to find the balance. I'm trying to find the balance. We need both. Amen? We need to be built up. Right? The Bible says that we're, as a pastor, you know what my job is? It's to equip you. It's to equip you for acts of service within the ministry and for what God has for you. But my job is also to provoke you to love and good works. Amen? So I'm supposed to encourage and equip you, but I'm also supposed to... Give you, you know, every so often just be like, no, oh, let's go. Come on. Right? That's okay. It's okay to be challenged by the word. It's okay to look at our life and go, hey, you know, there's some things that I need to change, but that's okay because I'm just going to be more like Jesus. I want to be more like Jesus. How many of you guys want to be more like Jesus? Come on. So we have to have the right doctrine. Do you know how we get the right doctrine? You ready for this? We form our life to the Word instead of forming the Word to our life. Not making the Word for us, but letting our life conform to the Word. And what happened with Hamas is he was unwilling to do that because his faith was shaken. See, if you don't know Christ for who He truly is, it's very easy for your faith to be shaken. If there's any idea that you get from anyone that Jesus is somebody that He's truly not, and I'm not telling you, look, I'm not, I'm not telling you that we need to go back in time and we need to see Jesus for who He really is, and I'm not saying that you have to have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John memorized. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is this. That you have to make a concerted effort in your life to say this. This is what I live my life by. And this is who I'm supposed to be. I conform my life to the Word. If not, then deception is at your door. See, really, the, the whole basis, the whole basis of this sermon tonight is very simple. You're in a ship, and you're headed to a destination. And there's only one way to get there. Now, you have a compass. You have things that help you get there. But the truth is, if you lose focus, you will become shipwrecked. You've got to keep your eyes on Jesus. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. And this is the wonderful thing. If you keep your eyes on Jesus, and you keep focus, and you don't let anything come in there, Guess what? You're going to make it. 
you're going to reach the promise and the destiny and the call that God has for you. Don't you believe that? Because that's what Jesus does. He bears fruit in your life. He bears fruit in your life. The Holy Spirit bears fruit in your life. And He is going to help you. He is going to guarantee. If you're with Him, He is the... Look, I want to be careful because I, I, I want to get close. I want to like sit up in there with you guys. It's so far away. Willie, Willie, Willie. I get, I get passionate. I got to calm down a little bit. It's that Italian part of me. It just comes out. That's why. I, 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 would, I would say this as we close tonight. We have to remain connected. You need to be constant in prayer. You need to be constant in the Word. You need to be constant in worship. You need to have a life that is constant in Christ. As that 10 year old boy looking at the destination, I didn't take my eyes off of it because the moment I did, if I just turned that wheel a little to the left or a little to the right, I'd be off. You've got to keep focused so that you don't get shipwrecked. That's what Paul was telling Timothy Timothy, remain focused. Don't be like Himaeus. Don't be like Alexander. Don't lose hope. Don't lose heart. Keep focused. God is going to use you. When all else fails, when questions come, when fear comes, and fear is going to come, when storms arise, what do you do? You use the word of the Lord to declare who you are and where you're going. Amen. You hold on to the promises of God. And you say, you know what, I'm going to fight back with this. God says that I'm a child of his. God says that I'm going to live and not die. God says that I have hope. God says that I have peace. God says that I have joy. God says that I have healing. Amen? And every time we do that, the lives of the enemy will fall short. Everybody stand with me. Come on. I love Wednesday nights. It's fun. You know, I I believe this with all my heart. You guys are about to step in to what God has for you. Some of you are, are going in the right direction. You're going in the right direction. But there have been some things coming at you, some distractions. The devil's been trying to cause some storms. You know, I, I want to tell you something. This is very interesting. This is a whole other sermon I can go into, but just real quick. Very interesting dynamic. Did you notice that Jesus never calmed the storm, the waves, or the wind when Peter got out of the boat to walk? Did you notice that? He never did. But yet, when the storm came to try and stop them, when they're about to drown, Jesus stood up and he rebuked the wind and the waves. Because there are moments in our life where even though there's storms, the greatest miracle is not Jesus calming the storm and calming the wind. It's, just, it's us being able to look beyond the storm to Jesus and walk in the midst of the storm. For many of you, God is doing that in your life. With every head bowed, every eye closed, you're going through a storm in your life. And you need the Lord to intervene. You need a miracle. And if that's you, I just want you to lift your hand right now. That's, that may not be everybody. I want, I want you to just lift your hands. And just keep your hands raised. It's okay. It's not a big deal. Just keep your hands raised. I'm going to pray an anointing over you. But I want to give one more call. Many of you are here. You see, you know, Pastor, I know that I need, I need to become more focused. There has been a lot of distractions in my life. And I need a divine focus in my life the promises. I'm not just talking about in your relationship with the Lord, but in the promises that God has for you, the direction that He has for you. If that's you, just lift your hands. Come on. 
Lord, you see the hands that are raised and you see, Lord, the hearts that this word touched tonight and the miracles that are needed, Father, in this moment. And Holy Spirit, I ask that you move in power. Lord, let your grace, your grace that is sufficient for us. Lord. We depend upon you, Holy Spirit. We need you, Holy Spirit. Come. Come on, if you can pray in the Holy Ghost right now, just begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. It's fine. Holy Spirit, we need your strength and your power. You said in your word, Lord, that we shall receive power, that dunamis power straight from your throne. Lord, when you come upon us, Father, so fill us up, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we need your help to have divine focus. But Lord, you have called us. You have chosen us for such a time as this, Lord. You know the plans that you have for us, Lord. It's plans to prosper us, not to harm us. Plans to give us a hope and a future. That is your will for our life, Lord God. And Lord, no longer we will, will we allow distractions. No longer will we allow fear and hindrances to stop us, Lord God. We declare the word of the Lord. And we shall break through tonight. That tonight, Lord, as we draw near to you, Father, As we draw near to you, Lord, there's a strength coming on us. And Father, even in this moment, just like that day that you did with Peter, or many of us, though you did not rebuke the storm, when we begin to sink, you're pulling us out. Lord, pull us out. Pull those who are out. And, and some of them feel like they're sinking. Lord, pull them out of that place that they're in. Give them the strength, Lord, to walk by faith and not by sight. And we thank you, Father, for it now. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said amen and amen. God bless you guys. We love you. Hold fast to the word. Keep focused. Amen. Amen. God bless you.